I went this morning to uh, NASA with my, uh, with my family um, to kill time because I was waiting on an opportunity to visit somebody and that time was not yet there and he lives just five minutes away from there. So I had the opportunity to take my family there and subhanAllah, I got there and as I sat in the first theater where they give you the history of launches and things of that sort and my daughter was sitting in my lap, it struck me that I actually remembered, subhanAllah, being sitting in my dad's lap, you know, decades ago, watching the same movie. <laughs> and I thought to myself, Tilka al ayam nas. SubhanAllah, how time, you know, flies and the days switch. And now I'm the parent and I've got a child in my lap. And it was absolutely uh, humbling to remember that, right? And subhanAllah, I had the opportunity to visit my uncle who lives, in, uh, who lives in Clear Lake as well. Many of you don't know that. I have a maternal uncle that lives in, in Clear Lake who subhanAllah has only been given uh, a few weeks or a few months to live. And I remember the days of joy and the days of happiness. And that made me think, subhanAllah, what, a, what an illusion this life is. But I don't want to give you all a message of despair. I don't want to give you all a message of no hope because what makes our deen so special is that it makes death, though we all hate it. No one likes death. No one likes thinking about death. No one likes that separation from their families and so on and so forth. But it makes it meaningful. There, it's not the end. We believe in something after. Not only do we believe in something after, we believe in something of more importance and we believe, believe in something more meaningful than that which comes before it. In fact, we see this life as only a preparation for that which comes after. So it gives us something to look forward to and it gives us something to think about and it gives us something to absorb and it allows us as we are departing from this world and I ask Allah for you and I, everyone in this room, husn al-khitam, a good ending because I've seen people with good endings. And I can tell you, having been around people as they're dying, SubhanAllah, being around righteous people when they leave this world is absolutely beautiful. You see smiling, you see calmness, you see tranquility, you see it in their eyes that they're already seeing something and you can see that they're already longing for something that's coming next. It's absolutely beautiful to see that because you know that there's something else. I can see Farhan in the, in the front row. You're around dying people all the time in the ER. Husn al-Khitam is beautiful. Seeing someone with a good ending is something that's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely beautiful. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us to long for that and to ask Allah for it. That Allah makes the best of our deeds the last of them. So I ask Allah that He makes all of us have a beautiful ending. He allows all of us to have a beautiful ending and to be greeted by angels of mercy that will wrap us up in the kafan of al-Jannah of paradise with the musk of paradise and take us to the illiyin, take us to the highest ranks and register us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because verily if that time is good then everything that follows is good. But the nature of my talk and what I'm going to share with you all today actually relates a lot more to what Shaykh Abdul Nasir was just talking about. What Shaykh Abdul Nasir was talking about were ayat and signs in the Qur'an and the signs that are to make you stop and pause and reflect and reassess everything. Reassess your spiritual state, reassess your direction, reassess whether or not your approach to life is fundamentally correct or flawed. It forces you to pause and reflect. And reflection is a broad term. Reflection is an umbrella. Because there's, there are a lot of different types of reflection and some reflections are deeper than others and more meaningful than others. And what I'm going to address is the other side of that. When it's not an ayah of the Qur'an, a verse of the Qur'an, but it's something that happens to you in life. It's a major shakeup that suddenly hits you in life and subhanAllah, it is so inevitable that everyone that thought they would have escaped it got hit with it at some point. That test, that trial, that's so different from every other trial and test in life. You've been hit with pain. You've had major, major tragedies in life and you were able to power through those and you were able to say Alhamdulillah and you thought because you succeeded with that test that any other test that comes to you in life, you're going to react the same way. 
you developed a sense of confidence and you see other people go through crisis. And when I say crisis, I don't mean crisis in regards to the scalability of the tragedy. I mean crisis in the way that they're responding to it. Crisis in the utter confusion that they're left in after they've been hit with that major tragedy. And you go, Alhamdulillah, that didn't happen to me. I went through a similar tragedy and I didn't go through that. And maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you in a different way. Maybe you were well fortified for the nature of the tragedy that that person was going through. So maybe you just really know how to deal with the loss of relatives. Though it's a very difficult test to deal with, but maybe you were really prepared for that. And you've seen other people lose their relatives, so when you lost your relatives, you were well fortified. But you never expected a test of another nature to shake you up in the way that it shakes you up. What am I talking about? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Uhud. She Fatima radiallahu anha, who was pregnant with Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, her first child, Umm Sulaim, the mother of Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with them both, and a few other of the women of the Ansar were holding their buckets of water and they had their, their, their bandages and they had their, their medical gear to nurse the victims of Uhud. They were only a few women because they had a sense of invincibility as a community because if we won Badr the way that we won Badr and only lost a handful of people, then surely we will handle Uhud the same way. If Allah gave us victory in Badr, where we, will, where we were less armed, where we were less equipped than we are now in Uhud, surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make this easy and we're going to win this and the amount of casualties that we're going to suffer are not going to be that many. So it's only a handful of women. Aisha radiallahu anha was one of them. And then the Muslims start falling. People start getting slaughtered and massacred. Some of them so badly that they cannot be recognized except by their fingertips like the uncle of Anas ibn Malik. And suddenly there is chaos and tragedy and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, we lifted our abayas. Their, the anklets of the women showed because they lifted their abayas because they were running to the battlefield, trying to nurse all of these people that are falling dead, trying to nurse all of these people that are critically wounded. Some women did it a little differently. Umm Ammar radiallahu anha stood in front of the Prophet and picked up a sword and started defending the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But suddenly this was a tragedy that was not expected by anybody. The believers had a sense of invincibility. What's happening here? The Prophet sallallahu is dead. That's what's being shouted out. Qatalna Muhammad. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself has been killed. The people are screaming. They try to run in different directions, but they're being surrounded by both sides. Everything has changed. The nature of this battle has changed. The Prophet ﷺ did not die, but he was very close. He was struck in various ways, in his shoulder, in his face. The blood was running down his face. The Prophet ﷺ fell into a ditch and literally had a man driving his helmet into his head. Both of his front teeth knocked out Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had to be carried because he couldn't even walk after the beating that he endured in the battle of Uhud. And Aisha radiallahu anha saw that. She saw the Prophet Sallallahu that day. She saw the hopelessness in the faces of so many people when they lost their dead. She saw Hamna bint Jahsh running to the battlefield over the mutilated body of Mus'ab ibn Umayr, her husband. She, he saw, they saw Safiya, the sister of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anha running to the battlefield. And the Prophet وسلم, told Anas ibn Malik, he said, go, or told Az Zubayr, go stop her, don't let her see Hamza, don't let her see her brother. And she's insisting and trying to go forth and see the mutilated body of Hamza radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet وسلم, said, don't let her come, don't let her see it. And the Prophet وسلم, cried on the day of Uhud in a way that the companions never heard him cry when he saw the body of Hamza radiallahu anhu. That was his uncle. That was his brother. He was the same age as him. He was so close to the Messenger He was so beloved to him. 
and he was, a, he was a pillar in this community. One of the first strong men, if not the first strong man to embrace this faith, and now he's lying dead and mutilated. That hurt. And the Prophet ﷺ cried a lot. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she remembers nursing the wounds of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the despair in the city of Medina, losing all the people that they did. Why do I give you this lengthy introduction? Because Aisha radiallahu anha said, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was Uhud the worst day of your life? Because she saw that. And she could not imagine a day more horrendous than the day of Uhud. She could not imagine a bloodier day, a day of more hopelessness and helplessness than the day of Uhud. Ya Rasulullah, was that the worst day of your life? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no. It was actually the last day of Ta'if. It was actually the last day of those two weeks of calling the people of Ta'if to Islam and being rejected in the way that he was rejected ﷺ and being run out pelted with stones and finding himself sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a lonely place under a tree where no one else is with him and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him and hears him in a lonely place where he could not complain to anybody other than Allah where he did not have emotional support where no one cared that he was crying the way that he was crying where no one cared that he was wounded that was the worst day of my life. Why? Did the Prophet ﷺ bleed more on the day of Ta'if than he did on Uhud? No. He bled more in Uhud. In Ta'if, he was pelted with stones and words. In Uhud, he was struck with swords ﷺ and literally almost killed. But Ta'if was worse. And Aisha radiallahu anha didn't see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Ta'if. She was too young. She wasn't married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at the time. She didn't know what that day was like. She didn't know what that time period was like. But she saw him in Uhud and just assumed that tragedy must have been the worst. Because that shook the community and it took away the sense of invincibility that this community had. But Ta'if was worse. Why? Why was Ta'if worse? Not because of the pain, not because of the wounds, but because the nature of the test of Ta'if was different. This was that trial that hits you so hard that it forces you to reassess and reanalyze everything that has happened up until that point. It makes you look back at life all the way up until that point and say, where am I going? What am I doing? Is it worth it? Is it the right thing? That's the breaking point in a person's life. That's the point where you, you know, the pressure has been building all this time. I mean, he was forced, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in the boycott, in the era of the boycott, to hear the kids crying at night because they were too hungry and they were too thirsty and their parents had nothing to feed them, nothing to give them. He had to hear those cries every night Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Jahl would stop him and say, you're doing that to your people. Your message is causing those children to cry. That's pressure, that hurts. He had to get in the grave Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and receive the body of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and bury her knowing that what caused her death or what, 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 what spurred it was the boycott that happened as a result of his message. Within the same three days, he had to bury his uncle Abu Talib. He had to see it all go down the drain Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a matter of 10 years after life was beautiful and fine and Khadija was smiling and Abu Talib was smiling and we were a happy family and we had nothing in our lives that would cause us any distress. Suddenly, he's lost them all and the pressure is building. But the breaking point didn't hit him yet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Prophet Sallallahu throughout all of that still knew it's worth it. If I've got to sacrifice this and that, family has to go, reputation has to go, we have, we're going to be persecuted this way. He still had that resolve Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He still knew it was worth it and he still had hope and determination that things were, just going, things were about to turn around. 
that where I'm at right now, and you can imagine if you're the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi standing in the empty grave of Khadija radiallahu anha receiving her body, that it can't get worse than this. I can't be treated any worse than the people of Mecca have treated me. It can only get better from here. He still had hope Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was still a sense of resolve, but Ta'if was the breaking point. Because Ta'if seemed to be the decisive closed door. That it is not getting better after this. It doesn't matter who you go to with this message. Each and every single time, the intensity of the rejection is only going to increase. And now the Prophet ﷺ is sitting under a tree in a Sayl al-Kabir, right around the era, era, area of Ta'if, and looking up and wondering, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, what is it? What now? What, what's the, what is the, what is the manifestation, what is this a manifestation of? Is this your anger with me, Ya Allah? What, what's going to come next? If I've been rejected by the people of Mecca, and I've been rejected by the people of Ta'if, and I've lost my family members in the process, what is possibly going to change now? What comes next? And is this a manifestation of your anger? That moment, that the Prophet ﷺ faced is a decisive moment. It's a turning point in his life وسلم, And all of us have that moment in our lives granted at a far less degree of intensity than what the Prophet ﷺ faced. But everybody gets hit with a moment like that in life, a test like that in life, where it's not about the intensity of the pain, it's the, the confusion and the wondering what comes next and what have I done up until this point where you start looking to your past and you start looking to your future and seemingly everything suddenly is subject to questioning. The constants in your life that you've had up until that point, your marriage, your family life, your career, whatever stability you had in your, in your life at that point, suddenly your foundation has shaken and you're wondering, what now? What comes next? For some people, it's the death of a, of a family member that they really love, someone that they could count on through thick and thin. For some people, it's, I've been a successful businessman my entire life and suddenly, suddenly my career is in jeopardy and I'm having to worry about paying the bills. For some people, it's I've had a wonderful marriage my entire life, our entire lives. We used to sit and tell each other that nothing would ever happen. And we used to look to other couples falling apart and say, that will never be us. But now you're questioning that as well. And then worse than all of that, billah, is when your faith, your foundation of faith is now subject to questioning. And you're going, is it all real? I mean, I know I love this deen and I know I felt great when I was at the seminar and at the conference and at the class and the masjid. And I know Ramadan was special and stuff, but is it real or is it not real? That type of test is the decisive test. It is the crisis that almost every individual and human being will face in their lives. And at that moment, it's a matter of the word that you will say and literally how you will react that will determine a tawalli or a takhalli Whether you will come into the guardianship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whether you will be left to face the rest of the tests that come after that in ways that you have no help. It's a really, really scary moment. For some people, it's the midlife crisis. A person reaches their strength, they reach their peak at the age of 33, then they reach the age of 40. They could look back and they could say, what have I done until now? They could look back and they could reassess their level of religiosity. And in this case, what Allah mentions to us, The person who reacted positively and said, Oh Allah, I recognize this ni'mah now. I recognize this blessing. I recognize the, the, the great burden that my parents incurred because of me and what they've done for me. I recognize that I'm at a very decisive point in my life. 
Rabbi awzi'ni an askura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayya wa ala walidayya. Oh Allah, broaden my chest, expand my horizon, allow me to really recognize it from now on and to thank you and thank my parents for the blessing of Islam upon us. وَأَنْ أَعْمَلَ صَالِحًا تَرْضَى And it's a rededication that from now on for the rest of my life, Ya Allah, I'm going to only do things that are pleasing to you. وَأَصْلِحْ لِي فِي ذُرِّيَّتِي And oh my God, I have kids I need to worry about too. Oh Allah, make them righteous. Don't let them have to go through the trials that I went through. Don't let them have to go through the confusion and questioning that I went through. أَصْلِحْ لِي فِي ذُرِّيَّتِي Oh Allah, correct them. إِنِّي تُبُتُ إِلَيْكَ I'm turning back to you, Ya Allah, I've, did, I've done a lot. وَإِنِّي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And I am amongst those who submit. That's one means of that point in life where it's like, okay, reassess, reanalyze, and it turns out to be the right way.